My name is Ken Garrett. I'm delighted you're here, as I said, uh, today to worship today. And I want to thank our full worship team today. That was pretty great. Thanks, everybody. And uh, uh, Greta, welcome to the worship team. Wonderful to have Greta up here doing her thing. And the kids with the things. I got to tell you, uh, it's been a number of years now, but I had an opportunity to preach in a a pretty good-sized church in uh, Nicaragua, in Managua, uh, years ago, and um, uh, what was that? Sorry, huh? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I got a chance to preach there. It was pretty great. And uh, um, there are these. They didn't have all the lights and bells and whistles that most churches that size would have. But what they had was amazing. These women had these long uh, silk-colored flags. With, that were really long. You guys have probably seen this before. And they're doing this thing. The band is up there playing, and they were an awesome band. They had that conga thing happening that was really out of, out of, out of this world. But anyway, the, these women, I think it was all women, they're doing this thing with these colored long flags where they're kind of like going in front of everybody. And so as we're sitting out there, it just looks like this this prophetic thing, these, these colors. And, and I thought to myself, now that would be cool to have in a church, some, you know, my church someday. Well, here we are this morning. And uh, what it goes around. God hears even the things we wish for. It was really wonderful. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, kids. Yeah. Um, okay. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of John. Uh, John chapter 6. I'll be speaking today from verses 34 through 40, uh, mainly to make one point about Jesus and where he stands in terms of the hope that we have on this Easter morning and the hope we have um, for life. And I'll jump around just a little bit after that. But we're going to stay and start in John um, chapter 6. And uh, let me read that for us, and then we will... Dive right in. I better grab my glasses here. Okay. And it's in your worship guide, too, if you want to read along from there. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 34. They said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I certainly will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That of all he has given me, I lose Nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Thank you for preaching the gospel to us, O Lord, out of your precious word. We thank you for this morning, this particular morning where we stop and remember you breaking the seal in an earthquake, shaking the rocks, the guards trembling and being unconscious and you arising to forever live from the grave of death so that you would have defeated death for us. We remember that. We remember you. All the Easter bunnies in the world can't make that truth go away. You, O Lord, O King, our master and our friend and our brother, And we thank you for that this morning. Lord, as we walk through this life, which we do in this church, in this community, we walk through it 
with uh, agents of death, our, de our, our declining bodies, cancer, our loss, troubles, the things that trip us up that we carry through life that we hope to leave at the door when we come in to worship you, and yet they're in us, the hard things of life. We stand before your cross and we affirm and we acclaim that you have overcome death. You have turned it into a momentary passage, a door we step through into an eternity of, of life and, and, and joy. So while we proclaim death, dead, defeated, yet it lives on on this side of the grave. So gracious King, we bring our pains to you this morning. Father, we bring the convulsions and the pains of our city and of our world before you. We don't do it in judgment or criticism because that's the water we swim in. But we bring it before you because we live in a world and in a culture that has somehow missed the beauty the magnificent kindness, patience, and beauty of your dear son, Jesus. Though they have seen, nonetheless, they don't believe. We ask you that they would believe, that they would know love, know their worth, know forgiveness of sin, and know true fellowship with, with him. We ask you for our nation and for this world, for the convulsions that it goes through as a world without the king, that it would be healed and that Jesus would return. We ask you especially for the city of Baltimore with the tragedy <clears throat> of, that it has faced in these last few days with the wreckage of the main bridge, the, the deaths that occurred in, in, in relation to that and the shock as the world saw it all happen. We ask you for the healing of this city for those families. Father, and we ask you that all of the events, be they the events in Ukraine, events in Gaza, events in China, events all over the world, we ask you that they would draw us nearer to you in neediness for Jesus and in prayer and in a commitment to love this beloved world that you have put us in. We ask these things and for your blessing today as we open this word for your blessing to speak clearly to our hearts. We ask you in the name of our risen King. Amen. So the main idea of today's message or the things that I'm going to talk to you about is simply this. Believe in Jesus and live. Believe in Jesus and live. Um, John chapter 6 is really, from the perspective of the Apostle John, the writing John, there is a John the Baptist. He didn't do any writing because he had such an amazing ministry. Didn't need to, I guess. But uh, John the Apostle is the writer here, and he wrote the story of Jesus' life, and it's called the Gospel of John. He wrote a couple of little letters in the back of the Bible. They're called postcards because they're so short. But this is the Gospel of John. It's a beautiful story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four different perspectives on the life of Christ. And John's is particularly wonderful for, for pagan Gentile Philistines like you and me uh, in that it is written uh, decades after the life of Christ and it's written with one goal and one goal only, that you would hear the story of Jesus Christ, the offer of the gospel, and in hearing you would believe and you would be saved from your sins. And when I say that, what I mean is saved from the judgment of a righteous God over your sins, same as I have my sins. And, and geez, God doesn't, it's not like heaven's all up there clapping and waiting for you and I to be judged. But the fact of the matter is we're guilty before God. And the purpose of this book is that Jesus came to bear that guilt himself. So it's a wonderful story of the life of Christ. And John chapter 6 is considered the high point of the ministry of Jesus Christ. This is before everything started going south. This is when he had multitudes of crowds following him around to do miracles for them, to listen to his preaching. It was really, really something. He, he, he was at the top of, you would say the top of his game, or I would say the people watching him were at the top of their game because they were giving their full attention to this magnificent man from northern Israel who made these astounding claims of deity, of being their Messiah, and 
all of these incredible miracles and signs. And um, it's considered the high watermark of, of his public ministry. At no other time did he have so many followers, uh, so many people willing to drop everything to just follow him. Um, in this particular chapter, we had found him taking five loaves of bread, and these are just little loaves of bread, barley loaves, which is the bread of the poor in ancient Israel, the simplest, most rudimentary bread that they'd carry around. And he took five of those loaves, prayed thanks to them, and began to multiply them out for a hungry multitude, 5,000 men at least, not counting women and kids. And so he fed everybody on those five loaves of bread. I don't know what it looked like. I don't know. Of course, I don't know how he did it. It was a miracle. Master over material existence. And there he was. So guess what? They decided that this was a really good thing. That this was actually a pretty good retirement plan. Uh, Stay with him and you will have three squares a day for the, for, forever. And he was so powerful, he could do anything. And, and you would begin to consider that this is certainly the Messiah you want to follow. You may not think he's God. You may not want to worship the man, but you'd want to stick with him for all that you would get. He, uh, was, uh, he was everything you would want. He was spiritual. He was a magnetic preacher. He was kind and gentle and loving. He couldn't pass a person in need without helping them or healing them. If you are a make America great again person, he would be your make Israel great again person. He he just seemed to promise that it was nothing but one empowering move after another, concluding with the destruction of the Roman military presence in Israel and him running the government. It it was just going to be great. And along the way, Every meal was taken care of. He could do anything. Well, that's what kind of got him into trouble as this chapter went on. As it continued on, he uh, actually, before his disciples, he walked on water. And then the next day, after a lot of crossing the Sea of Galilee to find him, uh, they finally found him. And they said, well, where, where did you go? And he confronted them and said, you... You're not following me because of who I am, and you're not following me because of anything to do with God. You're following me because you ate free bread, and you were filled with it, and you would like to continue to experience uh, that life. That's really true about us today in in a lot of ways. Anything good that we get out of God or out of the church or or out of the Christianity or anything, that's okay, and we really... We really like that stuff. And then the other things I think we might just ignore about obeying Christ, confessing sin, uh, addressing your behaviors and things, things like that. Um, we want what we can get out of Christ. I guess that's normal human behavior. And that's what they wanted. And Jesus confronted them on that. And they concluded by letting him know what we want is, what did they say? What we want is the bread. Lord, always give us this bread in verse 34. The reason they said that to him is because he said, I am the bread of heaven. I'm not like those five loaves that came out of an oven somewhere and that I miraculously multiplied for you. Those loaves came out of barley that was grown in the fields around you. Somebody ground it up. Somebody made bread. And that was that. I'm the bread that comes out of heaven. Heaven. I'm like the manna that happened to the Hebrews in the wilderness where it would come out of heaven. I'm the bread that comes out of heaven. And whoever receives me and whoever uh, 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 believes in me receives me, the bread of heaven, which gives life, he says, in verse 33, to the world, gives life to the world. That wasn't something that your run-of-the-mill Jew really ever thought of in terms of. The, the, the run-of-the-mill Jew in that time, same as I guess most religions, including a lot of Christians, they don't really worry a lot about the peoples of the world. And Jesus was always saying things like that. He was always giving these, oh, I think disturbing little hints to them that the, the whole thing that was going on between him and God and 
between him being there had to do with a bigger plan that was bigger than them, bigger than Israel, and it actually embraced the world. I am the bread of life come down for the good and the blessing of the entire world. And they said, Lord, we want that bread. Always, always give us that bread. Plenty of room for the rest of the world as long as we're always getting that bread. And Jesus you know, went on to say, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. Whoever believes in me will not thirst. Uh, but nonetheless, I've said these things to you with you watching me do these miracles, knowing what I'm capable of. And yet when it comes to me saying things to you that you don't quite want to hear, you don't believe in me. Isn't that something? People struggle today with believing in a good God or believing that God could possibly be a kind and tender-hearted being with our good, you know, in his, in his planning and all of that. They, they struggle with that, and I guess rightly so, for the troubles they have, but very rarely do they attribute the good in their life to him. The simple passing of the seasons, uh, the food that they are blessed and fortunate um, to have, and in America, the relative stability of a government, of a nation, that, that here we are today. We wouldn't be meeting like this if we were in China today. We wouldn't be a state-run church. We'd be maybe in somebody's basement or something and hoping we didn't get caught. And yet here we are. So looking at these things and attributing them to a kind and gracious God is something that we don't genuinely do, this, this world of ours. And certainly, it's not interested, the world around us, in this person, Jesus. Good enough things seem to happen without needing him. I've got bread, got what I want. And if I don't have what I want, I'll just work a little harder. And I don't need to bow down to your sky god, or whatever you want to think of him as, in order to feel okay about my life. I saw a bumper sticker once. It said, at least I'm not a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> that was a weird one. And I saw another one, uh, even before that, and it said, born fine the first time. Okay? And that represents, I think, in the extreme measure, the way people look at our faith of being Christians and being born again um, in Christ. And by the way, if you're with us today and you're not a Christian, um, we're going to do our best to try to be on our best behavior <laughs> and to be the real deal, and to represent what it truly means to know this magnificent person, Jesus, and to convince you of his love for you. Well, he, um, he had given them this tremendous invitation, believe in me and live, to their, uh, to their complaint. Give us this bread always. And that's the curious truth of it. Of course he was going to give them that bread always. He wasn't going to feed them and then trick them into changing their religion so that they could starve the next day out there in the wilderness. This was an example proving who he was. And yet they couldn't go far enough to truly believe in him. Now, he stood in front of them, and they were looking at him. So believe in him certainly doesn't mean those people that he's talking to believing that there's a dude standing in front of them named Jesus. I mean, I mean, of course they believe that. He was right there, right there in front of them. What he meant was uh, the, the same word in terms of its, its exact translation could be seen as the word trust. Trust in me. And trusting in Jesus simply, simply means uh, believing in what he said. And if you don't believe in what he says, you trust that you can talk to him about it and he'll help you get through it. And it also means trusting in his promises and trusting that if you obey the things in the Bible and the things that he said, that you actually are pleasing him and living a life that will draw you closer to him. That's trusting in Jesus. And so it's amazing that people don't trust Jesus today. Just as much, really, as those people whose bellies, I mean, they were still burping after the, good, after the bread that he'd given them and yet they couldn't see fit to follow him as their Messiah. They just wanted him to fight for them. So we see, first of all, a tremendous offer that's given to us through Jesus, and then a fact made that all who come to him, and Jesus goes out of his way to say they will never be cast away. All that the Father gives me will come to me. 
The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. That's God. A part of following Jesus, a birthright, uh, something that you receive, that you simply cannot lose, is the assurance of your salvation. Okay? Now, this is important. I probably just said it in some words that might not, you know, they might not click with what you go through when you sin horribly and you start asking yourself, how could I be saved? How could a person that just did that claim to be a Christian? I wonder if I really am saved. I, re- I wonder if I really am forgiven for my sins. I wonder if the future really does look so rosy for me after all. And I wonder if I haven't finally blown it finally failed, finally stepped in it so horribly this time that Jesus certainly will show me the door. And that's, a, that, that's an understandable feeling. And, and isn't it amazing? In the presentation of the gospel here, Jesus goes out of his way to tell us that all who believe in him will never be cast out. So you might say to me, well, Ken, how do I know I believed in him? Well, I would say, well, you know you believed in him. Ask yourself this, did you, believe in, have you, did you believe in Jesus? Have you believed in Jesus? And if your answer is no, I haven't, then I would say, well, here's the moment, you know, <laughs> believe in Jesus and be saved. And if you say, well, yeah, I did believe in him, I trusted him, but I've done this and I've done that and I just don't know anymore. And I would say, well, that qualifier is not in the text. It simply says, all who have trusted in him All who have come come to him are saved and will never be cast out. You can play around with that idea of being cast out all you want. It'll do nothing but drive you insane. Because the fact of the matter is all who trust in Jesus at any point in time, at any moment in their life, are forever held in his hand. You You might spend a life trying to jump out. You might, you might, you might, you know, you might be one of those living sacrifices that's always jumping off the altar. Yeah, I know, but you will never be lost to Jesus when he has saved you. He goes out of his way to say that. And then he concludes by saying some things about God, his Father. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he gave me, I lose nothing. But I raise it up on the last day. This is the will of my Father that Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. You know, if you belong to some kind of a club or some kind of an organization, like if I forget to pay my AAA, AAA towing club, they, they give me a couple of warnings, but, the, you know, if I don't pay it, man... I'm, I'm not there. I'm, we're not friends anymore. I, you know, they're not going to come when I call them. I'm not in the club anymore. And we've all joined clubs and we drop out of them and, and, and uh, we no longer are considered members of them because we've, maybe we haven't done anything terrible. We just left it. We've moved. We've moved on. We're no longer there. Not so with the Christian faith. You can pray to become a Christian and receive Jesus Christ and be saved and go on and royally mess up your life. Your salvation does not depend on your continued goodness, on your continued behavior, on your continued steady one hill after another successfully climbed at all, and it never has. It is solely dependent on the fact that when you believed, God took you on in his family and you are forever uh, forever his. So by way of application, I just I want to talk about some of the significance of that and, and tie it into what we're doing here today. And I'll do it in the form of some questions. The first question is this. Why does God the Father need to draw people to believe in Jesus to receive forgiveness of sins? Jesus goes out of his way to say, my Father draws people to believe in Jesus. Man, he's the best thing since, you know, I'm going to say sliced bread, but it kind of goes against the whole subject matter of the sermon. So I guess I won't say that, but you get my, you get my drift. Jesus is pretty great. Why would I need God to draw me to him? Well, because you are who you are, and I am who I am. And all of those days before you met him, you didn't believe in him. 
You needed something more. You needed the, 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 the wonderful grace of God, like a wind blowing into your soul to convince you, to give you a moment of clarity that Jesus is life. And if you but trust him, you can trust him and you are saved from your sin. You need God to do that for you. On your own, you can't claw your way to God. You require that wondrous work of God giving you the ability to believe. Um, And you need that because you ignore God. (laughs) You did ignore God before you met him, and you might do a good job of ignoring him now that you have met him. We as human beings spend a lot of time ignoring God and we have sins, and we have troubles, and, and, and although we want to be better people, uh, pretty marginal, really, how better we're becoming. It depends on your, on your background, I guess. But it says in the Bible that your sins create a separation between you and God. Isaiah the prophet said, your iniquities have caused a separation between you and God. And God, and because of your sins, he has hidden his face from you and does not hear. What a terrible thing that sin would separate people from God like that. It also says a couple chapters before that, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And of course, Isaiah is talking about a moral turning. And he says, but God has laid this sin, this iniquity of us all on the back of him. An innocent sheep killed as a sacrifice. So there again, we have it. There's something about us that likes to wander, something about us that sins, something about us that just can't get it right on our own. So the first good thing that God does for you personally is draw you give you an opportunity to understand, to see, to say yes to this magnificent person, Jesus. How does he do that? How does the Father draw you to his son, Jesus? It's amazing. It's it's almost different for every person. You know, I answered a question on a survey the other day. It was, how long have you been a Christian or something like that? And I remembered, actually, I, I think I was like five and I, and I, I, you know, I actually remember talking to Jesus then and telling him I was sorry. And, and uh, I think I was part of, I think I was saved. I was brought into God's kingdom then for, I don't know, <laughs> you know apologizing for not watering my dog or something, whatever, whatever terrible, horrible crime I committed. But nonetheless, I went to God. And, and that's really the, the, the way it works. Um, how does God draw a person? He drew me at that moment through being a little guy that felt bad about his life and felt, I mean, not not in any deep way either, just felt that I'd made some big mistakes that I felt really bad about and I prayed to God and, and I became a Christian. Some of you became Christians as adults after trying out one life pursuit after another, might be one religion after another, might be one lover after another, one relationship, one pursuit, one, one thing after another. You had a plan, and you tried it out, and it didn't work, and maybe you tried a few of those plans, and, and you ended up viewing your life more, <laughs> more like a train wreck or something, but you reached a point of coming to Jesus. God used that. Some of you were in the midst of success. You, everything was really going fine, but something in you, something in you told you, I still am missing something important here. And it became almost, uh, well, it became almost undeniable and unstoppable. The God, the presence of God coming into your heart, into your life, and drawing you to himself. So what I'm saying is it happens in many, many different ways. Sometimes you're sitting in a church. Sometimes you're sitting at home. I mean, but it happens in many ways where God finds a way to reach into your soul and draw your attention to Jesus and draw your belief um, in him. So that's how how exactly he he does it. What happens when a person does it, believes in Jesus as their savior? Well, in short, 
when you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you receive these wonderful blessings of God. Your guilt placed on him. Your shame might take some time to work through it, but guess what? He'll heal that. Uh, you, you, oh, so many wonderful things, joy in him, fellowship of other Christians and all, all of that. But also when you become a Christian and you, and you make that decision, the way the Bible puts it is you, you yourself become a new creature. You become a, a different person. You might challenge me and say, well, Ken, I still do the same things I did, still struggle with the same things I struggle with, and uh, I'm ashamed to call myself a Christian or something like that. That's not what the text is saying. It's saying, if anyone comes to Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have gone, new things have come. Something beyond your control happens that you are now in the eyes of God. And I shouldn't even say it that way. You are now substantively seen by God as a different creature because you have come to Christ. So you are immediately uh, changed. And you also leave one place and go to another. I'm speaking metaphorically here. You can stay where you live and become a Christian. But he says, he, Paul wrote this in the book of Colossians. He says, and Jesus has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus, in whom we have the forgiveness of our sins. Now, I know it doesn't, maybe to you, feel like you've been in the dark. Maybe things, maybe the darkness was a comfortable place for you. But in the eyes of God, and theologically, what happens when you believe in Jesus Christ is you are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, you were transferred from the kingdom of Satan and put into the kingdom of his beloved son. Satan doesn't have a kingdom. Jesus does. And you were transferred out of the darkness of a life without Christ, out of a life of groveling and groveling and, and snatching and everything to get a little bread for the day. And you were transferred into a kingdom of light where you are loved by God in the flesh himself, this man, uh, this man Jesus. So what does a person do? I think I've been saying this a lot, but what does a person do to receive this life, this forgiveness, this privilege, and this uh, uh, joy of a relationship with this person, Jesus, because he rose from the dead and he ascended. That means he went up to heaven. And through his spirit, he's with you today. And, and you can have a relationship with him. Now, you might say to yourself, Ken, you know, you lost me a long time ago with this stuff, but the idea that I have a relationship with a person that lived 2,000 years ago, okay, so he's alive and he's in this place uh, called heaven and I have a relationship with him. I don't see any relationship with him. Well, I would say to you, why don't you talk to him? Uh, why don't you ask him about that? Because I don't have the power to make him appear to you and for you to go, oh, wow, that's Jesus. Uh, who does? But the Spirit of God is at work. And I promise you that if you pray to Jesus today and say, I don't believe in 99.9% .9 of this because I can't prove it. It makes no sense to me. I don't, I don't get it. I get it. But there's a little bit of it in me that's really wondering about it. Jesus if you're the real thing, if you're there, would you please make it known to me? Would you please do that thing with the Spirit and draw me to yourself? Would you please do that? And don't let me miss it when you do it. If we're talking about 0.1% of something, pretty easy to miss. When you speak to me, when you are here with me, would you please make sure I get it? I promise you. I promise you. He will. Please pray with me.